So let's talk through all the various hungry bioforms of the endless swarms of the Tyranids, with a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of every unit in the Codex. Hello and welcome back to War Specs Tactics, where today we're talking Tyranids once more. In this video, I thought we'd talk through the various different datasheets in the Codex, a bit of a discussion as to their strengths and weaknesses on the tabletop, and why you might or might not want to take them, and a very rough power rating out of 10, for approximately how strong I would rate them in general at the moment. We'll go through the Codex by Codex, talking about every single one of the datasheets, and take each section in turn, starting with the troops, then moving on to elites. We'll also talk about just a few of the more notable Forge World options at the end as well. Loads to talk about, so let's talk some bugs and get into the troop section. So first up, and perhaps most notable amongst the troops, are the Tyranid Warriors. 30 points per model, and since the book came out, they've been a pretty durable and tough battle line for the Tyranids. All the troops are objective secured and core, which does make them quite good for buffs, and Tyranid Warriors are basically the ones that you'd want to take if you really want to focus on damage dealing. Their toughness really isn't too bad either, with 3 wounds at toughness 5 and a 4 plus save, but they combine that with some okay fire at range, with strength 5 AP2, and decent melee with a flurry of bone sword attacks. For upgrades, I'll be most tempted by things like Venom Cannons, which are quite good value for the points just to add in 1 per every 3, and depending on whether or not you're building around a big squad of them, then things like the Adrenal Glands, Toxin Sacks, and Flesh Hooks can all be useful. They get to be quite efficient upgrades if you're using them on, say, a big unit of 9. One unit of warriors is quite tempting to have somewhere in a list just to allow the synaptic imperative for melee as well. Exploding sixes to hit in combat is pretty handy for a tyranid list, provided you're not entirely out of combat, that's going to be a pretty handy one to trigger at some point. On top of that, they provide synapse themselves, they can trigger a minus one damage for stratagem to make them a bit tougher, and they're quite a good target for any single unit buffs, things like hive commander or catalyst. Overall, as solid battle line troops go, I feel like they're hard to go too far wrong with, I think I might have been ranking them before, like 10 out of 10 before, when they were so easy to spam in Leviathan, getting the transhuman physiology. Now that rule doesn't work on them, they're a lot more tempting for other high fleets, more so than Leviathan, I think. And while their durability isn't terrible, both small arms and heavy weapons will deal okay damage to them, which maybe isn't the ideal place to be in, as most units will be effective at killing them. Otherwise, particularly now, they don't get the Leviathan transhuman type thing, Raveners maybe competes fairly well for a similar unit profile, We'll talk about them later, but they're also very good. Overall though, I'd rank them a 9 out of 10. Certainly one unit to trigger the synaptic imperative seems good in most lists, and definitely a unit that you can build around on the battle line for damage and defence if you want to. Moving on in the troops, we have three different flavours of swarms, and first up we have the Termagants. They're 7 points per model base, the cheapest troop slots that you can get at 70 points, which is kind of handy, and in general I'd say their role is usually just going to be to hold down objectives with the minimum possible investment. I will admit that even with the strength 5 and AP-1 Flesh Borer, for 7 points neither their damage or defence is particularly outstanding, though they are a unit that can get some fairly easy buffs from stratagems and things. There's a fair few buffs that don't work on bigger critters than swarms, and you can regenerate a bunch of them for 1 CP. I have seen at least a fair few competitive lists building around big units of them backed up by a Turvagon. That is a pretty good pairing to be honest, you get to respawn the Gaunts with the Turvagon, plus shield the Turvagon with the Gaunts, and that big HQ spawner also makes them hit a bit better with a plus one to hit with their Flesh Borers. If you stack maximal buffs on them, then they can be kind of threatening in certain high fleets, they're perhaps just not always the ones that people choose to build around with though. Otherwise, in the troop section, one disadvantage is that they compete with units like cheap Gargoyles or Hormagaunts, both of which do a similar job, but also get to move pretty fast as well, so I feel like perhaps if you just want the one unit in the troop slot, those two might be a bit more tempting. Overall, I'd say the Termagants are perfectly usable, either maybe just as a single cheap unit, or a big unit to build around with a Turvagon though, I've ranked them a 7 out of 10. Moving on, we've got the Hormagons, which I think are probably the most niche out of the troops units at the moment. 8 points per model, again, means that with their strength 3 attacks, they just aren't particularly outstanding in melee, unless you give them loads and loads of buffs from multiple sources. They are fast-moving offset troops, though, and at least they have a bit of melee synergy, which can be good, as a few melee things can target the swarms. They're the best recipients of those. They work quite nicely in both Hydra and Gorgon, for example. They can take toxin sacs and adrenal glands, though they are pretty expensive, in my opinion. Again, I'd probably expect these to be run a little bit less than some of the others, they're a bit slower than gargoyles, and not particularly efficient in terms of damage dealers, maybe one or two units to venture forward and spread some objective secured goodness into the midboard. I've ranked them a 7 out of 10 overall, though perhaps on the lower side of that, I feel that termagants are a bit better to build around in big units due to the support of the Turvagon. 
Moving on, and we've got Gargoyles, again a swarm with 8 points per model, and their cheap objective secured troops, but they get fly and a 12 inch move as well, which I think is generally well worth the extra plus 1 point over Termagants, even if their save is a little bit worse. I feel like they maybe do the cheap objective secured chaff rule better than the other two. They can very easily get where they need to be with the 12 inch move and potentially advancing if they need to, and if you want to, you can even jump them round the board for one command point to return to deep strike and then come back next turn. Besides that, they've still got some of the swarm things like regenerating models, and they've also got a unique stratagem for blinding venom to make the enemies a bit worse at damaging them in melee if it matters. Again, like the others, their damage dealing is pretty underwhelming for 8 points, and they're not that tough. In general, they're a unit that I think about taking one or two units of to help fill troop slots, but not really expect them to do any heavy lifting besides jumping on some objectives. Overall, though, for that role, I think they're pretty reasonable. I'd score them an 8 out of 10 in total. Elite's units next, and first up, we have the Many Limbed Gene Stealers, 16 points per model, so at least fairly expensive for one wound infantry. I'd say probably the biggest reason to take them is forward deployment. It means that you can start them on midfield objectives and get to work on objectives and actions early plus potentially threaten first turn charges, where they are quite threatening to one wound infantry. I'd say that their defence is probably quite weak overall, though they do have a 5 plus invol and a 4 in melee, which does help a little bit, and I feel like they're perhaps a better choice in high fleet behemoth for strength 5. Otherwise, for support options, they can choose to take an infestation node, which can help respawn them a bit. I think it is a bit pricey though, and they're often just going to get wiped out outright if they do get exposed. I'd say most stratagems are probably a little bit too expensive to be using on them most of the time, but they do get free acid moors, feeder tendrils and flesh hooks, which can be helpful for stratagems and secondaries. In general though, I do think that they have issues and they don't seem to be played very commonly in top Tyranid lists. Very easy to kill when they're exposed, and they might well be exposed more than most if they're forward deploying. Their damage output isn't terrible, but it's not particularly exciting against anything that isn't fairly low toughness. And in particular, these guys might be a little bit jealous of the Gene Stealer Cult Pure Strains, which are both cheaper, get a 4 plus invul all the time, and get to advance and charge. Overall, I'd rank them a 6 out of 10, maybe 1 or 2 units in a list for forward deployment shenanigans, but I probably wouldn't go too heavy on them. Moving on, we've got the Pyrovores, a unit that was perhaps outstanding when the Codex drops, but Games Workshop gave them a pretty hefty points increase, going all the way up to 40 per model. Their Flame Spurt attacks do some pretty reasonable damage against light and medium infantry, they get the choice of two different profiles depending on what's more useful. Plus they do have a fair amount of other things going for them. Okay toughness, a small amount of melee if they need it, and a core infantry unit that allows them buffs. You could potentially field them in a couple of different ways, either cheap individual units to hold down objectives and potentially do some serious skirmishing with enemy light infantry trying to take them, or jump them out of a Tyrannocyte and deliver a flame spurty alpha strike. I'd say probably their biggest issue is they're just a little bit harder to use than some of the units, they are fairly slow and their range isn't amazing. It does mean that if your opponent really wants to keep some units safe from them, it might not be the hardest thing in the world to do so. Exploding on death probably doesn't help them too much, particularly if they're bunched up with other units in your army. And just in general, they're a little bit less efficient than they were with the big points hit going up to 40. For a slow moving unit that doesn't get the biggest choice of their target as well, they're not enormously efficient against heavy targets. Overall, I'd rank them a 7 out of 10. Still pretty usable, I think, though nowhere near as standout as they were before. Next up, and guarding the biggest bogs around, we have the Tyrant Guard, 40 points per model, and these guys' role in life is usually to stop your Hive Tyrant getting shot too early, loiter one behind them, and even if there's just one of them left, then you won't be able to target it as if it had lookouts. sir. Hive Tyrants are perhaps some of the most efficient units in the Codex right now, and it seems that the vast majority of successful Tyranid lists tend to use at least one Hive Tyrant, and these guys to hide them behind. In particular, it can be pretty brutal with, say, a winged Hive Tyrant with the Reaper, they jump out a massive 16 or 17 inches, smash something in combat, and then use Overrun to retreat to safety. In their own right though, these guys certainly aren't a terrible unit. They're very tough for the cost with toughness 6, 4 wounds and a 2 plus save. They've got multiple different melee weapon options, and I've seen people run various different combinations. They get a plus 1 attack near Hive Tyrants as well, and if the Hive Tyrant does get slain, then they can potentially go into rage mode and get big damage buffs against the unit that killed them. They're quite easy to take in the Force Organisation slot as well, as a Hive Tyrant makes them slot free. As for weaknesses, maybe being fairly slow doesn't massively help them, particularly as both flavours of Hive Tyrant do move a little bit faster, and they don't have the option of any shooting attacks or anything to contribute to damage while they're just guarding the boss. Still though, pretty efficient, seem very usable just on their raw stats, but making one of the best units in the Codex very safe is a price worth paying for most lists it seems. Overall, while Hive Tyrants remain almost auto-include, I'd rank them a 9 out of 10.
Moving on, we have the sinister floating venom ropes with too many tentacles. The spore cloud produces a 35 points per model, and their main benefit is giving a minus one to hit for nearby high fleet units, potentially pushing that all the way out to 12 inches if you do want a turn of shielding your army from a bunch of enemy firepower. Their damage and defense aren't enormously standout, but I think that they're reasonable enough to get them by while they're doing this buff. They've got a little bit of melee threat against infantry with a few mortal wounds thrown in, and perhaps more importantly, a chance to prevent fallback, which could be really disruptive against some armies if they can get in close and they survive to make combat. They also have the feeder tendrils, which can help out for secondaries and things. In general, I would say that you mainly need to make use of their minus one to hit, plus their damage and defense profiles to really make them worth it. I'd say that, that means that you really just want limited numbers of them, maybe just a single unit in a list. Still though, I think that they bring very reasonable value just for a small unit of three of them. I'd rate them an 8 out of 10 overall, a unit to take one of, but maybe not to spam. Next up, we've got the Zone Thropes. The Psychic Brain Bugs are 50 points per model, and perhaps currently one of the most auto-include units in the Tyranid Codex. Even if they were a terrible unit in their own right, they'd be very tempting as they allow that synaptic imperative across your whole army, which gives every model a decent invul save, the infantry a 5 plus 1, and the monsters a big 4 plus. All you have to do is keep your units in synapse range. They're really not too bad in their own right though, really quite decently tough with 4 wounds at toughness 5 and 4 plus invul all the time, plus a pretty scary and consistent mortal wound output where you get plus 1 to cast witch fires and plus 1 mortal wounds with smite per model in the squad, meaning that you average something like 6 mortal wounds each time they manage to cast smite on the enemy. If you can allow that to happen 2 or 3 times over a game, then they've likely killed more than they cost us. Again, they're easy to include as they're slot 3 with a Neurothrope, also one of the strongest units in the book, and they can advance each turn without hampering their psychic, meaning that they're a little bit less slow than they really should be. As for downsides, besides an army-wide invul and the psychic powers, they don't really do much, and I feel like you perhaps get some slightly diminishing returns after one unit, due to only needing one to get the whole army involved for a turn. They also got a little bit less good in Leviathan recently, as they don't get the transhuman type rule for even more toughness, though I still don't think it's enough to make them not be taken. Overall, pretty much an auto-include, while they give a whole army buff like that, plus decent mortal wound output, I've ranked them a 10 out of 10 as one of the best Tyranids units. Next up, we've got the Sneaky Stealthy Lictors. These are 70 points per model as disruption units, single models that can pop up and more some elite infantry, as well as do a few other bits. For this role, they do have a fair few advantages. They can't be shot at at range over 12 inches away if they get their cover. They get to fight first, a flurry of attacks at damage 2. They get deep strike deployment and can set up very close to the enemy if they venture anywhere near your own deployment zone. And a couple of other hander bits, including feeder tendrils and a pheromone trail stratagem, allowing you a better charge roll against a unit that they're next to. Definitely quite a lot of fun stuff going on there, though I would say that their damage and defence are at least fairly weak per point. Seeing as they're more about being disruptive, I feel like you probably don't want loads of them, maybe one or two in an army at max for utility, and Pheromone Trail won't actually be that reliable if they pop up, as you would need to make your own charge first. They also do have competition from the Death Leaper version, who can play around with objectives and things. Overall, I think I'd rate them probably a low 7, an interesting and annoying commando type unit that can potentially punch up and slay a bunch of isolated infantry, but you do pay a bit of a premium for that, and it's not super reliable. In a similar vein, and basically competing for the same role, we have the Death Leaper. He's 120 points, so 50 points more. And you do get a bunch of extra things for that, like a 4 plus invul, a character keyword, better melee damage, and turning off enemy melee stratagems. I feel like perhaps the most interesting thing for him, though, is getting the warlord trait that counts as 5 models and objectives secured. It can be pretty nice just to have him pop up and then flip objectives off the enemy after eradicating a bunch of enemy infantry. He is another unit that Games Workshop tones down quite a bit. At his points cost, he was very, very good, I thought. But now he costs a great big 50 points extra from Elixir. He's a bit more take or leave. Again, his damage and durability isn't awesome for the cost if he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy damage dealers himself. And if you want to mess around with objectives and things, I feel like probably the Parasite and Mortrex is now the better choice due to having that enormous movement and being fine with starting on the board. Like the Lictors, I'd probably rate him a low 7 out of 10 or a high 6. Definitely an annoying threat with options and very usable. Next up, we've got the other big spore caster of the list in the Toxicrine an 150 point monster in the elite section, and it attacks with toxic lashes, either as a close range shooting attack or in melee, and they are pretty efficient damage against lighter infantry and monstrous creatures and things, automatically wounding on a 2+, plus with a whole stack of attacks at AP2. The damage is okay, I do feel that he's at a big disadvantage due to being a ground bam melee monster, he's not always going to have the best choice of what he's going up against, 
And if he fights something that's very tough, like say 2 plus save terminators, or has to fight things like vehicles and knights and things, then that melee damage is just not going to be very good at all. He does bring some interesting utility to the table though, a minus 1 to hit for nearby enemies within 3 inches, a chance to keep enemies in melee which is quite powerful, and quite a lot of options in terms of stratagem support with things like acid blood, toxic lashes, spore caster, and also sphere tendrils too. In general I do feel that the toxic rim might just be a little bit on the underrated side, keeping things in melee and the close range debuffs is pretty handy. But at 150 points, the damage output not being very generalist, I think really does hurt it. Only moving 8 inches a turn, it's just hard to get those debuffs into the right place that it wants to go. And it's not really very easy to hide on the board as well, with the enormous profile that it gets due to those tentacles. Overall, I'd say it's maybe one of the more overshadowed monsters, sadly. I'd rate it to 5 out of 10 currently, though I don't think it would need that much of a buff to get far more viable. Moving on, we've got the Harrispex, 170 points per model and a dedicated melee murder machine that wants to run forward and bite the enemy very hard. It either gets to attack with its claws for damage D3 plus 3, or a whole bunch of attacks at AP1 and damage 2 to kill infantry with them more, and its toughness is okay with 15 wounds and a 2 plus save at toughness 8. The Tong's got a ranged attack that can snipe enemy characters, it's got a leadership debuff of minus 2, and the Horned Chitin and Acid Blood keywords can both be useful in the right situation. I say again, unfortunately, I think the Harrispex is just a bit overcosted for what it really brings to the table. For 170 points, all dedicated into a melee unit only that doesn't really do much else, it really does need to hit very, very hard when it gets into combat, and I'm not sure its numbers are quite destructive enough at the profile they are. There's just a lot of competition from other melee damage dealers, things like Hive Tyrants and Carnifexes that also bring other things to the table, and I feel like it leads to this guy being rarely seen on the field. Overall, I'd rank him a 5 out of 10 at present. Not useless, but I think that there's other monsters that are stronger. Next up, we have the Maliceptor. 220 points as an elite's choice, and this thing was nerfed spectacularly since it came out with its ridiculous mortal wound output, though I still think it's usable enough. Its durability is still kind of fine for the cost, given its 4 plus inbor save all the time, and if you can get it somewhere in the middle of the board in a threatening position, it can be spitting out an awful lot of mortal wound each turn that it casts, Give it the Neurothrope cast on d6 drop the lowest, and between a couple of witch fires, you're probably spitting out around about 10 mortal wounds on the enemy, if you can trigger its psychic overload. A bunch of those mortal wounds also completely don't care about line of sight as well, which is pretty powerful. On top of that, it can also do psychic actions to help against ranged damage, Worsening the strength of enemy weapons can be pretty meaningful as it moves up the board. It has synapse, making it even tougher in High Fleet Leviathan, and it has a little bit of melee threat as well should reliably kill a few elite infantry, or maybe put 4 or 5 wounds or so on a tank. As for its biggest weaknesses, it's probably actually bringing the thing to bear on the enemy. It's fairly short ranged if you want the good psychic overload rule, and only having a movement of 8 inches is just going to be a little bit harder to get it up the table while also remaining behind cover with a reasonably big base. It's now pointed at a premium due to all the mortal wounds that it can spit out at 220 points. It's definitely not in the auto-include territory anymore. And they did also clarify in an FAQ that the psychic action that it does, does count as a cast, even if you're in the synaptic imperative for doing actions while casting, and that stops it from getting three activations of psychic overload. Still though, seems very usable still. If you can get a couple of maximal activations and spit out 20 or so mortal wounds on the enemy, then it might well have done enough to justify itself, never mind anything else it does. Overall, I'd rank it an 8 out of 10, maybe a slightly lower 8 or higher 7 perhaps, remaining a fairly usable, if high investment, mortal wound damage dealer. Moving on to the fast attack next, and first up we have the Morlock. This one's 125 points. I'd say it falls into the category of being a fairly cheap and expendable monstrous creature, though one that is fairly tailored as trying to kill one wound infantry and a bit underwhelming against anything else. Its main trick is that it can burrow up in the middle of the enemy and potentially cause a bunch of mortal wounds, though the enemy is able to get out of the way of that, making it just a little bit less overwhelming. And then when it arrives on the board, if it makes combat, it gets a big 16 attacks that will chew through hordes well enough, but will still struggle against anything with good saves or are tough, particularly those with armour of contempt. Otherwise, when it's on the board, I would say that it's really quite tough for the cost. 14 wounds with a minus 1 to hit is pretty nice at 125 points. It might be a bit more of a low priority threat for the enemy to deal with, so if it's right in the front of their army, you might well soak a fair bit of damage. In combat, it has the chance for bonus mortal wounds from its jaw, plus the toxin spike attack, plus having the burrower keyword means that you could potentially go into underground once more and emerge again later. Overall though, I feel like at this point's cost, Tyranid players just aren't particularly keen on the Morlock, I haven't seen very many run at all in any sort of competitive list, 
Now, I feel like maybe just having one as an annoying disruption threat, maybe trying to threaten enemy infantry on objectives, wouldn't be a terrible use of them. I'd rank it a 5 out of 10 overall. Again, maybe a unit that isn't so terrible if it got a small boost, or some of the good stuff got reined in. Kind of with a similar story, we have the Trigon. The Trigon's 20 points more than the Morlock, and basically it gets a few trade-offs for that. The extra cost gives it far more threatening generalist melee. 12 attacks at AP3 and damage 2 will be quite good at threatening things like space marines, while still clearing out a bunch of light infantry as well. It also gets a bioelectric pulse for anti-infantry shooting, and it can deep strike, though it doesn't get the big jaw attack when it comes in. I feel like Trigons quite like High Fleet Behemoth as well to get them up to strength 8, which makes them good against a few key toughness brackets. As for downsides, I feel that being at 20 points more than the Morlock is just not as expendable, which doesn't help too much, and if you are using the deep strike deployment that it has, it's not that likely to make a charge into combat unless you get lucky. Again, in a codex with a whole bunch of different monstrous damage dealers on offer, I feel like the Trigon struggles to break through. Overall, I'd rank it a 5 out of 10. Again, reasonably tough, usable enough melee damage this time, but costs a fair bit, and it's maybe just a little bit harder to get to combat in the right place. Otherwise, in the fast attack, we also have the Spore Mines. Overall, just a very, very underwhelming unit from this datasheet that they have. I think, in general, if you want Spore Mines in the army list, then you're probably better off buying one of the things that's going to spawn them in. Quite a lot of efficient units do so included in their cost. If you're buying a unit, their role is basically just mortal wound objective denial. If the enemy charges onto an objective, for example, then you have a chance of doing mortal wounds to them. Though honestly, for 10 points, not very many. Against several units, you might do less damage in points cost than the spore mines cost themselves. Otherwise, beyond the actual damage that they do, they really don't do very much. They can't do actions or stop enemy deep strikes via screening. They're kind of slow and hard to get that damage output off in the first place. They're very much mines as opposed to things that you charge the enemy with. They're very easy to kill if the enemy can draw a bead on them. Only toughness 3 and a 6 plus save is bad durability at 10 points. And if you want something to fill their role, then either the mucolid or spawning them in will just do that a lot better. Overall, I've ranked them a 2 out of 10 for that reason, just very underwhelming indeed. Speaking of spore mines though, the bigger one I think is a lot more usable. The mucolid spores are the big ones that you get with the spore assist type kit. They're 20 points per model, and basically just do the exact same role as the spore binds, but far far better. Each one only costs the same amount as two spore binds, but they give you far more mortal wounds for that cost when you actually get to trigger them. D6 mortal wounds on a 2 to 4, or D3 plus 3 on a 5 or 6. Generally that is going to be worth the trade-off when they trigger, and on top of that they're also cheaper than spore mines per point, and they come in smaller units if you want to use them to fill detachment slots or something. Weaknesses wise, they're kind of similar to spore mines, they still will die pretty easily when they're shot, they're still not super reliable to actually deliver the damage to the enemy, but they can be pretty annoying to have on an objective if the opponent really needs to move there and isn't able to shoot them down, they might well be paying for their victory points by taking a big chunk out of their units. Overall I'd rank them a 6 out of 10, I have seen the odd competitive list running a few of these, they still don't see enormous wide play though. Moving on we have the Sinuous Raveners. 35 points per model, and kind of equivalents of Tyranid Warriors, but get a few other strengths and drawbacks. They cost 5 points more than Tyranid Warriors, though get a few less equipment options, a bit more melee focused overall. They're far faster, they get more wounds, more attacks, and a minus 1 to hit in melee, plus deep strike and the Borrowers keyword if you want to have them popping on and off the board. Big units of them can certainly be a useful target for buffs and things, being core infantry. I think that they work quite nicely with High Fleet Kraken for their extra speed. Overall, I think they're a solid generalist battle line unit. Take maybe the Devourers and one of the combat weapons and charge them up the board. I'd say the main trade-offs that I'd be looking at them for is whether you want them or Warriors. The Warriors fill troop slots and their objectives secured and bring their synaptic benefit to the table. And these things are a little bit more expensive, though overall are probably a little bit better in terms of raw threat and damage for their stats. Overall, I do think the Raveners are really quite competitive for the Tyranist now. I'll probably rank them a 9 out of 10. Moving on, we've got the super fast moving little nightmare that is the Parasite of Mortrex. 80 points per model, and a fairly nasty little unit that can bounce around the board, ideally skirmishing with and destroying enemy units, spawning rippers all over the place, and messing around with enemy objectives. Perhaps one of the biggest advantages is that it's really fast and got quite a small infantry profile. It can move 16 inches, then charge something, and with its small profile, it's pretty easy to hide behind terrain to get there. In melee, it's got enough attacks to bully light infantry, and has multiple different chances to spawn annoying rippers, potentially infesting a unit that it deals damage to. You can also infest a unit by moving over it with a stratagem, and you can take that gestation sack 
which can be good as it can move very quickly and then throw out a bunch of annoying ripper bases. The warlord trait that it can get is quite good, canting as 5 models and objectives secured. That's very very nice on something that can move 16 inches and still be pretty threatening in combat. And you can combine that with the chance to infest units and that can cost the objective secured by the itch. Otherwise it's kind of handy just to have fast moving synapse that's easy to hide. Could support things moving up the board like maybe harpies or something. And if you're stocked for a synaptic benefit, then you could use its swift onslaught synaptic imperative. Getting an extra 3 inch consolidation could be handy enough in melee if none of the others are going to be that handy this turn. As for downsides, it isn't a unit that's going to be doing much heavy lifting. It's underwhelming against heavy targets and only kind of good against light infantry. And it's not particularly tough when it's exposed despite an inbuilt minus 1 to hit. Despite that, it does seem to be a unit that a lot of lists just use one copy of for the fast moving and objective flipping. Overall I'd rank it an 8 out of 10 overall. Pretty usable for that role. I could certainly be annoying with spawning some rippers and if the enemy leaves any unsupported isolated light infantry. Speaking of rippers, they're in the fast attack choice as well. 15 points per model and a lot worse than the previous version of the codex. They're no longer troops, they lost their deep strike, they don't fill up mandatory detachment slots and that's added to the downsides that they already had being pretty slow on the board and pretty much no melee damage against anything that's stronger than Gretchen. For their biggest benefits, they're somewhat annoying to kill with 4 toughness 3 wounds, plus get a plus 1 save in the cover and a low profile so your opponent might not be able to hit them very well. I guess there's some advantage to having a cheap expendable 45 point unit just to sit on points and do nothing else, even if they don't have obsec. Overall though, they just feel like there's a whole bunch of units that do their job better than they do, even the Forge World Sky Slasher Swarm version of them seems to be vastly better than them now. They get at least a good move and the ability to deep strike, so are a lot better if you just want some chaff. Overall, if you desperately wanted to include a unit, you could just have them sit on an objective or be an annoying screen, but I feel like they do have things that directly outcompete them, so I rank them a 3 out of 10 overall. While we're on the subject of fast things, I thought we'd talk about the Flyers. First up, we have the pretty nasty Harpy, 175 points base and was certainly one of the strongest data sheets when the codex dropped and hasn't really been toned down that much in the points nerfs so far. The Harpy is just an all round strong flyer in every different aspect. Flyers move quickly so they can get line of sight on key enemy units when they need to and this one has some pretty decent damage dealing with the stinger salvos plus either the strangle thorns or the heavy venom cannons both of which are good. It also gets a nasty mortal wound bomb as well, particularly good against certain units like 10 man at 1 wound infantry squads. On top of that, even if it can't bomb, it can spawn some annoying spore mines each turn, at least has the option of some melee damage if needed, and isn't even all that terrible in durability with the minus 1 to hit and a bunch of wounds. For upgrades, it's got a lot of nice adaptive physiologies as well, maybe the key ones that a lot of people seem to run are things like the 4 plus inball save, making one of them synapse to support perhaps another harpy running alongside, and there's one for extra mortal wounds when shooting as well, just for some reliable extra damage every time that it fires. As a flyer, it does have some disadvantages, not very easy to hide, and means that it might get shot down turn 1 if your opponent's got a ton of long-ranged anti-tank, and it's kind of limited in use for objectives. You can also only take two of them in a list in match play at the moment as well, which is perhaps one of the biggest limitations for it. Overall, very scary, and just all round good on every level. I'd rate the Harpy a 9 out of 10, one of Tyranid's strongest data sheets. For its counterpart flyer, the Hive Crone, I say that this thing maybe isn't enormously behind the Harpy since the points increase. Its damage output is still fairly generalised, a bit more skews to attacking light targets and infantry with things like that Drool Cannon. Its combat's a bit better than the Harpy with that Spur as well, and it's a bit cheaper at 160 rather than 175. Realistically though, while the Harpy exists, I don't feel that many lists are going to bother to run a Crone when you can only get two Harpies max. I feel like the main guns of the Harpies just outcompete this a fair bit, and plus missing that big mortal wound bomb is quite a significant downgrade. I'd rank it a 6 out of 10 and still pretty usable if you want to run one, but the Harpies are pretty much better. Heavy support organisms next, and first up we have the Spore Mine Flinging Biovores, 45 points per model, and these guys have become a fairly common include in competitive Tyranids lists, usually maybe 2 or 3 of them just to throw a few mortal wounds against key enemy units or potentially do something irritating like block some movement. Having a bunch of mortal wounds flung off across the battlefield is generally pretty handy. You can use it to finish off some injured targets that the enemy really wants to hide, and there's at least a fair few options for getting synaptic things with line of sight on them, either things like winged hive tyrants, harpies with the upgrade, or the parasite of Mortrex. 
As for weaknesses, their damage output is a bit on the limited side. They're not generally going to be used as a mainline damage dealer just because they have a premium on their mortal wounds. And it is a bit annoying that their barrage fire isn't unrestricted as well. You do need the synapse unit to get a target. They're also not core, so there's limited buffs available. But maybe that's not the worst thing in the world just to have a few of these sat on a home field objective, flinging out some bombardment organisms to contribute to the battle while staying safe. Overall, pretty usable in small numbers. I'd rank them an 8 out of 10, all things considered. Next up, and perhaps one of the scariest Tyranid threats that got reined in pretty brutally when the Codex came out, are the Hive Guard. These guys were Terrors of the Tabletop after the Tyranid Leviathan supplement came out, but now in the new book, they're a bit more expensive at 50 points per model, have more limited options with their barrage weapons, and lost the vast majority of buffs that you can put on the unit. As for their strengths, they are at least fairly tough particularly in cover where that 2 plus save will help them out. They've got a rule to help them at scoring objectives, counting as multiple models, and their firepower does ignore hit roll modifiers, which is kind of helpful in 9th edition where they're at least fairly common with things like dense cover. Unfortunately for them, I just don't think that their firepower is that strong. The Impaler Cannon is short ranged and not really all that general purpose. The Shot Cannon is okay against vehicles, but less so against other things, and you can't really get any massively meaningful buffs on them to make them more efficient. Add that to being slow moving and being hard to bring their firepower to bear than some of the other big heavy support guns and it just makes for a unit that very rarely gets taken. Biovores basically seem to outcompete them at the moment. I'd rank them a 4 out of 10 overall, maybe a little bit harsh could perhaps have been a 5, but I feel like with all the other options available for shooting, these guys are going to be pretty much bottom of the barrel. A fair bit more positively, we have the archetypical Tyranid heavy hitters in the Carnifexes. They're a heavy support choice that you can field in a brood, so you can get a fair few of them if you need to, and they cost 115 points based on their standard data sheets. Carnifexes do have quite a lot going for them, and it feels like Games Workshop do want to make them the most general purpose, well-rounded monster. They're pretty tough with a 2 plus save and minus 1 damage. They've got fairly good damage output, both at range and in melee and they're super super flexible, with perhaps one of the most single most customizable data sheets in all of Warhammer 40k, between things like upgrades, carapace options, and various weapons. Out of all those options, maybe one of the most commonly run combinations is the Venom Cannon buffed by Enhanced Senses, plus one of the melee upgrades to allow them to pack a punch in combat as well. They perhaps particularly like Leviathan for single rerolls on things like Venom Cannons and powerful combat attacks, and the core keyword means that there's the potential for giving them a fair amount of buffs, maybe throwing something useful their way when they're just about to make combat or something. Not degrading is kind of handy as well at 9 wounds, at least it means that they'll be a serious threat until they're dead, unlike things that get bracketed like say the Exocrine or Tyranifex. Besides the standard Carnifex datasheet, there's also an option for the Screamer Killer one or the Thornbacks, I'd say that both of those two are maybe just a little bit below the standard data sheet in my opinion. I'd say the Screamer Killers is my favourite out of the variants, throwing out a bunch of Bioplasma at the enemy before hitting them with big melee. The Thornbacks just seem a little bit overly restrictive, I feel like they're not quite as solid as the generic variants. Weaknesses wise, without invul saves, they are particularly susceptible to things like high AP weapons. A bit of a different damage profile to the majority of monsters, extra tough against things like damage 2 plasma, but a fair bit less so against things like melter weapons with plus 2 damage. Otherwise, not being super fast generally means they are going to be taking the brunt of enemy strike backs, they don't really have the movement to jump from terrain to terrain, so they are going to be taking enemy fire as they slog up the board, but they can contribute with some of their own. I also feel that they're maybe just a little bit behind some of the best monstrous damage dealers, things like the Harpies and the Hive Tyrants perhaps, Still though, for all that, I think that they're very, very usable. I'd rank them an 8 out of 10 overall. I've certainly seen a fair few successful tournament lists that run several. Moving on to the biggest bog in the heavy support section, we have the Tyran effects. This one's 170 points base, and this thing's a bit of a mighty beastie. 17 wounds at toughness 8 and a 2 plus save, and I'd be going for either the Acid Spray or Rupture Cannon as the main damage dealers, whether you want to hose down medium infantry in the midfield, or put some seriously scary damage on heavy hitters lurking in the back. I feel like maybe there's not too much intelligent to say about the Tyran effects. It's a tough bug that shoots fairly well against its ideal targets, but maybe isn't very general purpose in its damage output. In some games it's just going to be a lot more useful than others, depending on what you match up against. Overall, for its raw numbers, I think it's pretty reasonable to include. Maybe a little bit less general purpose than the Exocrine, maybe, but I'd still rate it pretty highly, a 7 out of 10 here. Lastly, for the heavy support section, we've got the walking gun bug with the bioplasma that is the exocrine, 200 points after the increase from Games Workshop, and maybe doesn't feel a million miles away from the Tyran effects, slightly less durability at only 15 wounds and a higher points cost, 
though I'd say more threatening in general purpose damage output on the whole. D3 plus 6 shots at strength 8, AP4 and damage 3 is something that's going to be felt by just about anything that it points its nozzle at. It's kind of handy that it also ignores cover as well. Enemy armor saves really aren't going to be stacking high against this thing with the AP-4. It gets that if it's stationary, and there's a pretty usable 1 command point stratagem for exploding 6s to hit, and also getting the ignores cover on the move. If you need to move and then need to fire against something in dense cover, then that seems a pretty reasonable one to pick up for 1 CP. Since the points went up, I feel like maybe it's just a bit more take and leave versus the other Tyranid damage dealers, but I feel like with such a general purpose main gun, it's really going to be a bad choice for a Tyranid list, lurking in the backfield and taking some chunks out of whatever nasty thing rears its head. Overall, I'd rank it an 8 out of 10, a very usable gun bug. Moving on, we have the disturbing living transport that is the Tyrannosite, basically an 110 point Tyranid drop pod that can deliver a brood or a monster into battle. This one has a bit of an extra niche by delivering units turn 1, where often in games you aren't allowed to, so it's kind of a way of getting an alpha strike with a tyranid unit for paying a points premium for this thing. It's perhaps good with anything with fairly short range or that needs line of sight, things like maybe pyrovores or potentially something like a maliceptor might not be the worst choices in the world. Then, much more so than a space marine drop pod, this thing can be a bit of a menace while it's on the battlefield. It does actually have some credible shooting on its own, with 15 devourer shots hitting on fives, and a little bit of melee if the enemy gets in combat with it. Just the toughness on its own is fairly meaty to chew through. 15 wounds at toughness 7, even if it is just with a 4 plus save, it's at least going to soak up a few heavy weapons or an assault or something. As for downsides, obviously it isn't spectacular in terms of damage dealing on its own right. You would need to be getting good value both out of the transport and out of it being a nuisance when on the board. I feel like it maybe does pay a bit of a premium for that. And to be honest, while it's helpful, I think it's not the worst thing in the world to have the majority of Tyranny units just start on the board and move up normally, and it might just not be worth the extra price for the transport for this. I feel like Pyrovores were perhaps one of the best targets to put in it, and now they got toned down a fair bit, it's just not quite as attractive. The damage output does get very poor indeed if you have any minus ones to hit going on as well. Hitting on 6s isn't great. Overall, I'd probably rate it a 6 or 7 out of 10. It's a transport option that not many Tyranid army lists seem to make use of these days, but if you can get good use out of it being a transport and an annoying distraction, then it could well justify its cost. Moving on, we've got the Tyranid fortification in the Spore Assist. 95 points base, and it basically gives you a 4 deploy fortification that can set up in the midfield and do a few handy things for the army. It has the same sort of damage and attacks as the Tyrannicide, a bunch of death spitters hitting on fives, but can also help out expand the synapse web a little bit by giving it to organisms going forward, provided you've got a synapse unit within 12 inches of the spore assist. And perhaps most fun out of everything is its ability to seed spore mines. Each time you complete its action, it gets to set up another 6 new spore mines somewhere within 18 inches of the model, and that could be kind of annoying for just clustering them all over objectives, or potentially putting them in a really unhelpful situation for enemy vehicles and things to move past as they can't finish their move on top of them. It does seem that they do manage to make their way into a competitive list every so often. A few turns of mine spawning I think can probably be worth it, and the damage and synapse are just added value. As for downsides, it is a mobile, so the opponent could potentially do some annoying things like lock it up in combat. That could prevent the rest of your Tyranid army from firing at them if it matters. The fortifications have deployment restrictions saying that you can't set them up too close to terrain, and that could be annoying on certain terrain-dense battlefields. Plus, just in terms of raw toughness, this thing isn't that hard to kill for a fortification, only 10 wounds and a 4 plus save. Still though, seems usable and disruptive enough, I scored a 7 out of 10 overall. Lastly for the codex sections, let's talk through the HQs, and start out with the leader beasts of the Hive Tyrants, and we'll also talk about the Swarm Lord here. Hive Tyrants are HQ choices, 210 points base with wings, 180 base on foot, and 240 points if you upgrade to the Swarm Lord. Hive Tyrants do seem to be basically quite auto-include for the Tyranids at the moment, it's rare to see a competitive list without one. They're just all round strong from the utility that they bring, and when they're combined with other units and warlord traits and relics and stratagems and things, they get a lot worse. First up, just on their raw profiles, they're generally fairly strong in terms of damage and have reasonable defence with a 4 plus inball save. You can protect the big investment with Tyrant Guard, and they allow you access to a synaptic imperative called Relentless Ferocity, a turn of all of your units being able to fall back and charge, if that is going to be a big enough deal to trigger it. They've also got a couple of psychic casts, and the fact that they're such a big and strong unit in general makes them really quite a good target for things like Warlord Traits and Relics. You'll get more value on them than most other creatures. Out of the variants, I would rate the Winged One remaining strongest at the moment. It's got enormous movement with 17 inches with Adrenal Glands, 
The Reaper of Obliterax still remains a standout good relic, despite Games Workshop capping the mortal wounds that it spits out. It can give it some Warlord traits, and it potentially can be zipping in, smashing something of the opponents, and then retreating with Overrun back behind some Tyrant Guard, so potentially it can kill something big and then escape to safety. The Foot Hive Tyrant is by no means bad either. It's tougher with Toughness 8 and a 2 plus save, it's a fair bit cheaper, and has better damage as it gets both a decent combat weapon and also a powerful gun like a heavy venom cannon, often upgraded to powerful things like shard gullet. Certainly not bad to have in the heart of a swarm, buffing things with psychic powers and rerolls, and then if the enemy gets too close, it's a massive counter charge threat. Unfortunately, after being so good prior to the codex, the swarm lord is probably the weakest of the three for the points. He does cost significantly more all the way up at 240, and it's maybe just a little bit more limited in roll. He's a walking tyrant that brings massive melee, and he does have a nice chapter master style reroll buff, but aside from that, he doesn't have the speed and the Reaper of Obliterax that the Winged Tyrant gets, or the cheapness and the heavy firepower that the Walking One has. He does get very good combat though, and can ignore damage in melee, which is quite powerful. As for downsides, Games Workshop does seem to have built in some drawbacks for the Hive Tyrants. If they're in the list, then they need to be your Warlord, and if they get killed, then you lose your Synaptic Imperatives for the rest of the battle. Will be quite a big deal if that happens too early. You also can only take one per detachment as well, which means that if you want to spam them, which a lot of lists do, you have to pay for the privilege by taking a patrol or something, and fork out a few CP. Overall though, I'd still rate Hive Tyrants as perhaps one of the single most competitive units in Codex Tyranids right now, particularly the winged one with the Reaper of Obliterax hiding behind some Tyrant Guard, I've chosen to rank them a 10 out of 10 here. Moving on, we've got the Tyranid Prime, basically the Lieutenant of the Tyranids, the cheapest HQ choice at 85 points base, and on his base data sheet, he perhaps doesn't do an awful load of things, is an okay melee combatant for the cost, and he gives one of your core units a reroll once to wound. I guess if you just want a cheap character to bear a warlord trait or relic, then he's not the worst. I'd say maybe one of the biggest draws to play him might be his good synaptic ranged imperative. It gives you exploding sixes to hits at units that are sort of close to your shooting. I think perhaps his biggest downsides are that there's fairly strong competition against the other two really good HQs, the Hive Tyrants and the Neurothropes, and Neurothropes really aren't too much more than him. The vast majority of the other HQs also get psychic powers as well, and he does not, and the Tyranid ones are good. Overall, I'd rank him a 7 out of 10. Usable, and certainly so, if you've got a very range-focused army, and you want the big turn of extra damage, but probably not one of the standout choices. Otherwise, in the HQ slot, we've got the Trigon Prime, 175 points base, and this thing really isn't so different in profile to a standard Trigon, but gets synapse, and it is a character so it can bear things like warlord traits and relics to make it more scary. With a large volume of strength 7 and damage 2 attacks, it does get on quite well with certain buffs, say for example the more claws of Thyrax to re-roll those wound rolls. I must admit though, I feel like the Trigon Prime is perhaps one of the least appealing HQs. It's kind of a similar points cost to a walking hive tyrant, and just feels far inferior to that. It lacks any sort of psychic defense or an invulnerable save, and it's quite likely to get targeted by heavy weapons. It does get the minus 1 to hit, I guess though and its synaptic imperative I don't find particularly exciting either. It's one that makes the death throws of your monsters a little bit more likely to go off, plus gives you the chance for some mortal wounds in melee when the enemy's killing swarms. It's not dreadful if you think that you're just about to lose a big chunk of your army to combat, though I wouldn't rate it as one of the strongest synaptic imperatives. Overall, I feel like it's probably one of the weakest HQs, fairly expensive, not enormously destructive, and you can't even protect it with things like Tyrant Guard. I've chosen to rate it a 5 out of 10 here, I think in its current version I would run something else. Moving on, and a bit more positively, there's the Turvigon, 215 points base, and that gets you a great big brood progenitor who can spawn you loads of termagants. The Turvigon's decently tough in its own right, with 17 wounds and a 2 plus save, and it can't be shot if it's hiding behind big termagant broods, taking a big squad or two of 30 gaunts seems to be the way to go if you're running one. The Turvigon's perhaps the biggest thing that might actually encourage you to run big squads of termagants, they can give them plus one to hit, and they get their nice gaunt spawning rule, where you get to replenish 2d6 termagants into the unit, potentially bringing the squad back to quite a big amount of health. And if there happen to be no squads that need replenishing, then you can spawn an extra unit of 10 termagants once per game, handy enough for sitting on objectives, or just acting as an annoying screen. Just by spawning that initial squad, I do feel like you get a fair amount of recouped value out of this. Otherwise, it's got a little bit of shooting, a small amount of melee, and one psychic power as well, a little bit in all three phases, plus its synaptic imperative is quite a good one, perhaps particularly in the early game, a plus two inch movement can be handy for getting to objectives, or getting some good lines of sight on the targets. 
As for weaknesses, I'd say that it kind of depends on the fairly expensive Turbigants at 7 points each to be good. If they were a little bit more efficient, then Turbigons would be run quite a lot more. Though in their current form, I think they're really quite usable, just maybe not auto-include good. Again, has strong competition from other HQs that you might be tempted to run first, but I think a Turbigon is kind of fine to run. I'd rate them a 7 out of 10 overall. Might have been an 8 if I was feeling a little bit more generous. Moving on, we've got the Alpha Genius Dealer in the Broodlord. He's 120 points, maybe feeling like the Tyranid HQ choice that's the Jack of All Trades, but perhaps Master of None. He moves at least fairly fast. It's got okay speed and okay melee, plus a psychic cast as well. Probably the other two most interesting things for him are that he can forward deploy, so he can help out with an Alpha Strike if you're trying to attack your opponent hard turn one. I do feel though that if you go launch him into the deployment zone, he's probably just going to get killed straight back in return. His synaptic imperative can be good in the right list as well. He gives infantry light cover or heavy cover if they already had it. So if you've gone fairly big on infantry with reasonable saves, things like Tyranid Warriors or better maybe, then he perhaps becomes a bit more interesting. As for downsides, I feel like he doesn't do anything super well to be honest. The melee is pretty good at killing two wound space marines, but he's going to struggle against anything tougher. He's really not too hard to kill at all when he's exposed with a fairly bad save, and his imperative is a lot more useful in some lists than others. If you're running a fair amount of monsters, it's going to have far less value. Overall, I'd rank him a 7 out of 10, probably erring on the lower side of that. I feel like he's just a bit overcosted at the moment, at least compared with a bunch of the other options. For one of the real stars of the HQ section though, next up we have the Neurothrope, 100 points for the model, and again he seems to be one of the units that's almost auto include in Tyranid lists, it's rare to see a list in tournaments doing well without one. First up, the Tyranid psychic powers are pretty much good throughout, particularly things like Catalyst and Onslaught are nice, and he casts psychic powers very efficiently, two casts for 100 points, and then a plus one to cast on them. He also has his command ability of cast on 3d6 drop the lowest, which he could either use on himself for yet more reliability, or say give zone throbes a better chance of super smites, or malaceptors for hitting the threshold for those three extra mortal wounds. This casting reliability seems so good that a fair few people like to run him with the synaptic tendrils warlord trait, which allows him to use it twice. Between that and the plus one to cast, it also makes him pretty nice if he needs to use mental interrogation or something for your secondary objective. Otherwise, if you want yet more psychic goodness, he's a reasonable choice for taking the resonance barb for more choice of powers. It's pretty annoying to kill with a 3 plus inval save, you can really roll high with him and him just tank a whole round of high AP attacks, and then as if you needed more, he's got spirit leech that can heal itself or nearby zone throbes, and if you happen to have too many elite slots, then he can allow a zone throbe choice to be slotless as well, and fit inside detachments easier. With all that going on, it's perhaps not too surprising that he doesn't do too much outside of psychic, but with the sheer amount of psychic goodness that he brings to the table, I think he's well worth it, and competitive lists seem to agree. Currently I'd rank him a 10 out of 10, pretty phenomenal value as a buffing character. Finally for the Codex HQ choices, we have Old One-Eye, the unique character Carnifex who hits very hard in melee indeed. This guy's got some pretty brutal melee damage going on, 9 attacks at strength 10, AP 3 and a big damage D3 plus 2, all hitting on 2s, plus a fair few bonus attacks from his talons and tail. Fairly simple and destructive, generally he wants to hide behind other Carnifexes and things and be screened as a character, Buff the Carnifexes with a plus 1 to hit, and then make melee and kill something important. For 235 points, it's not bad, and he is fairly destructive, but I do feel that that's really quite a lot to be investing in one character, particularly as he is one who is not enormously fast as well, and as a ground bound monster has a bit more scope for being screened out or outranged by the enemy than some. His buff isn't amazing to be honest, as it only helps out one Carnifex a turn, as they don't come in squadrons or anything so it's a bit limited and will be a lot nicer if you could use it on multiple. His toughness isn't particularly spectacular when he's exposed as well, the same as a normal card effects with a bit of regeneration, but I suppose his warlord trait could help with that a bit, giving him a 5 plus feel no pain. Overall, I'd say he's usable and a fun model to put on the table, but probably just costs a few too many points to outcompete the other very good HQ choices, unless you're going for some sort of cool card effects theme list or something. Finally, I thought we'd go through a few of the more notable Forge World selections that you can take, I thought I'd mainly focus on some of the ones that I feel are most usable. Besides the ones that we'll talk about here, I feel that Myotic Spores are pretty much outcompeted by the Mucolids. The Hierophant Biotitan is just a fair bit overcosted and probably not as good as the Haridon if you want something that enormous. And the Stone Crusher Carn effects flatly outcompeted by regular ones. For the ones that are maybe a bit more interesting though, compared with the Codex units, first up we've got the Malanthrope. Admittedly, I do feel like he's kind of overcosted, 
150 points for a minus 1 to hit character lurking in the ranks. It might have been kind of good in 8th edition, but isn't quite so standout now. Definitely not unusable, and nowhere near as easy to gun him down as it is Venom Throats, but I feel like for most lists, Venom Throats are probably the better option to go for. They do a bit more in combat, and they also have that nice trick of preventing fallback. I ranked him a 5 out of 10. In the fast attack selection, we've got the rather enormous threat that is the Dimacaron. He was certainly one of the scariest bugs around before the Codex came out. It was kind of lost his edge a bit, seeing as all the stats for the monsters in the codex got inflated by quite a bit. He's a big 280 points, and admittedly is really quite fast, jumping over terrain, very dangerous in melee with a big damage D3 plus 3 attacks, and if he does kill something in combat, then he gets a 5 plus feel no pain on top of his 5 plus imbul. For weaknesses, his damage output is just a touch limited against non-heavies, and seeing as the codex monsters got way better, people aren't putting this big Forge World critter on the table quite so much. In the heavy support section, we've got the Hyra Jewels. I feel like perhaps the Scythe Hyra Jewel is one of the slightly more interesting Forge World units right now, perhaps kind of feeling similar in role to the Tyran effects with the Acid Spray, but actually packs some moderately threatening melee damage as well with damage D3 plus 3. He does have his trade-offs though, he loses the Stinger Salvos, isn't as tough with a worse save, costs a fair bit more, and the Acid Spray is only damage 1, which is quite a lot to pay. Maybe a little bit borderline with transforming melee from pretty bad to very good, but I feel has maybe more of a role than some of the other Forge World units. I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10 overall. Moving on, we've got the Barbed Hyra Jewel. This guy is similar to the Scythed one with the similar melee, but instead he gets a 2 plus save, and a fairly general purpose gun with 6 shots at strength 8 and damage 2. It's certainly not terrible shooting, and is fairly general purpose, but even given the melee profile, I'm not sure if it's quite worth it enough all the way up at 275 points. I feel like he's probably going to be worth it with his weight in Carnifexes rather than him. Moving on, and we've got the great big Tyranid Dragon that is the Haridan, that won 700 points. I was certainly very intimidating in the Crusher Stampede formation where it got a bunch of extra stratagems, though between that and some stratagems in the Codex being restricted, I feel like it's a fair bit more tame than it was. Still though, some armies are just going to really struggle to deal with a big unit with toughness 8, 34 wounds, and gets minus 1 to hit with being a flyer. It can just pretty much swoop around the board, deleting a few key threats, though in general it will have to do a fair amount of damage if it's going to justify its huge 700 point cost. It's a pretty huge commitment to a list, and it maybe does revolve around building your army in a certain way, but I feel like for the cost, again, it's one of the better Forge World units, I'd rank it a 6 out of 10 overall. Finally, and also worth a mention for Flying Chaff, I think, are the Sky Slasher Swarms. In the previous book, they were basically the slightly worse version of Rippers, costing more and not getting objective secured or being troops, but now the fortunes are reversed a bit, and they're probably the better version of Rippers now, due to the extra movement and still retaining Deep Strike. They still have similar problems, in that they're basically going to do almost no damage to the targets, and they just want to get in the way. But at 45 points for a cheap little nuisance unit, it could be something good for move blocking, or flying onto some hidden objectives and things. Perhaps a good unit to try and force the opponent to have to trade for, and they're not too bad at soaking up big high AP, big hitting shots. No real saves to speak of, but getting quite a lot of wounds for their points. Definitely outcompete the standard rippers at the moment in my book, but still a bit on the niche side, and not a lot of lists choose to run them. Overall, I'd rank them a 6 out of 10, usable enough as maybe 1 or 2 as an annoying distraction unit. So with the forces of the Forge World Compendium done, that just about brings us to the end of our look through each and every Tyranid unit in the 9th edition codex. Let me know your thoughts, and if I've missed anything important in terms of strengths and weaknesses for some of the units here, always look forward to hearing new insights and takes on the models, particularly any tricks for getting more value out of maybe some of the more underwhelming things. In any case, if you enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I've made similar overviews of units for the majority of factions in Warhammer 40k now, and if you'd like something else Tyranids to watch, I've not so long ago made a whole faction review of the Tyranids, including covering a bunch of other things from the Codex, such as support options and stratagems and warlord traits and things. I'll leave a link to that one in the video description below. Otherwise, if you've been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's how I can afford to make great big long videos like this with quite so much regularity. It does take a lot of time and effort. If you have been getting good value out of the content, any support on the Patreon page is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, 
The link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.